You've heard the shocking statistics before. Half of all marriages end in divorce. But did you know that two thirds of second marriages end in divorce and nearly three quarters of third marriages end in divorce too? What's more is that most relationships that do not even make it to the altar also end up in a breakup. So what's the issue here? Why do we as humans have such a hard time having and sustaining successful, long-lasting relationships? In this video, we're going to deep dive into the remarkable truth about relationships. Why most relationships fail. Also, stick around to the end as I'll share with you six signs that you need to be careful so that your relationship is not doomed. Make sure to like and subscribe. It lets me know that you enjoy the content I'm making for you. Now, why we crave and seek love. Marriages and relationships end up for a variety of reasons, be it abuse, a clash in personality, beliefs, values, life goals, or the biggest one, infidelity. All of the above reasons, however, are the result of one or both partners burdening the relationship with the fantasy that it will cure all their problems. You see, we have this belief that a romantic relationship will unlock a life full of happiness and fulfillment. The psychiatrist M. Scott Peck called romantic love a myth. The myth that true love is the cure all to all our worldly problems has the power to destroy one's capacity to cultivate the healthy and realistic love that sustains fulfilling relationships. The myth of romantic love tells us that when we meet the person for whom we are intended, we will be able to satisfy all of each other's needs forever and ever, and therefore live happily forever after in perfect union and harmony. Of course, movies, TV shows and songs encourage us to seek out love, promising that when we find that great love in our lives, the heavens will open up, angels will come down and we'll sing and we will all truly be happy forever. Modern culture is centered around the theme of a lost and lonely individual who finds the perfect romantic match and thereafter experiences a life of happiness and fulfillment. Unless you're Ryan Gosling and Rachel McAdams in The Notebook, in which case you're so obsessed with this fantasy that you're willing to end current relationships, forgo your morals and even end your own life so you'll probably live happily in the afterlife. The psychologist James Hollis called this perfect romantic match the magical other. And he suggests that as traditional sources of meaning such as religion, family and community have eroded, the pursuit of the magical other has intensified. So much so that many people today deify love as the central source of life's meaning. Hollis wrote in his book The Eden Project, one of the false ideas that drives humankind is the fantasy of the magical other, the notion that there is one person out there who is right for us, a soulmate who will repair the ravages of our personal history, one who will be there for us, who will read our minds, know what we want and meet those deepest needs, a good parent who will protect us from suffering and, if we are lucky, spare us the perilous journey of individuation. Virtually all popular culture is fueled by the search for the magical other. In the early stages of a relationship, it can appear as if one has found their magical other. That is because we experience a flooding of dopamine and oxytocin in the brain. It's the same feeling you experience when you eat your favorite sweet treat or watch your favorite movie. We also experience the instinct that has been instilled within us from the age of cavemen, the mating instinct. That probability of reproducing is really hard to ignore. The experience of falling in love is so appealing that it makes us idealize the significant other. Now, these emotions of lust, compounded with the feelings of, of excitement, blind us to a point which we cannot see the faults and flaws of our partner. But they have, and many. The blossoming beginning of love is often referred to as the honeymoon phase. We all experience it when we first fall in love, but why is it always simply a phase and therefore has an expiration date? You see, the emotions we experience of those deep feelings of infatuation, happiness and euphoria 
breathe the illusion that life is now complete. And there are other emotions that are working in the background here. For example, once ego boundaries collapse as they merge psychologically with their partner. This is synonymous with what we experience with our mothers at birth. James Hall has pointed out, in some respects, the act of falling in love is an act of regression. And as Scott Peck explained, the unreality of these feelings when you have fallen in love is essentially the same as the unreality of a two-year-old who feels itself to be king of the family and the world with power unlimited. Just as reality intrudes upon the two-year-old's fantasy of omnipotence, so does reality intrude upon the fantastic unity of the couple who have fallen in love. One by one, gradually or suddenly, the ego boundaries snap back into place. Gradually or suddenly, they fall out of love. Once again, there are two separate individuals. We have all different needs when it comes to being in a relationship, but where do these needs come from? Now, we talked about how popular culture promotes this fairy tale idea of searching for that magical other. But what may surprise you is that often this search comes from a childhood lacking of sufficient parental love, affection, and attention. So we always try to find it throughout life. A child who does not receive steady and dependable caregiving tends to develop into an adult afflicted with feelings of insecurity, a fragile identity, and pervasive feelings of emptiness. A person raised like this will often try to fill this emotional void by anchoring their sense of self in a relationship and by seeking a romantic partner who can assume the role of a maternal or paternal figure. Okay, real quick, if you're watching this video, then you're probably someone like me who really values relationships. Maybe you're someone who struggles with the relationship or who just want to make the relationship even better. For me, there was no other way to start this journey other than going back to my childhood memories and how my early experiences shaped my perception about how to relate to others and how to interpret how others relate to me. One of the recent revolutions in childhood psychology is the understanding of how children relate to their parents and how this relationship shapes the kid's perception about relationships and then it carries out throughout life and throughout all of their relationships. So how we attach to our parents basically and how our parents interact with us, we develop the so-called attachment styles. Your style might be secure, avoidant, dismissive, or fearful. And the majority of us pass on all the issues that our parents passed on to us to our kids. So if you want to learn how to understand childhood psychology and raise children who attach to others in a healthy way, or if you are someone who wants to understand more about your own childhood and how the consequences of your parents' parenting styles are affecting your relationships now, I created this online program on childhood psychology. In the 12 lessons of this course, we explain how children attach to their parents and how these attachment styles define all the relationships throughout life. We deep dive into how children develop their sense of self and identity and how their mind works from stimulus to perception all the way up to forming what we call mental representations and then how these representations manifest into actual behavior. Okay, I'm not going to go into more details because I want to get back to the video, but if you feel like you want to understand more about childhood psychology, I'll leave a link in the description below. Back to the video. The search for reflection from the magical other is also the dynamic of narcissism, which manifests in the adult who, as a child, was insufficiently mirrored by a loving, affirmative parent. Now stop and think about what you need or crave from your partner, or think back to your own failed relationships. And you may realize the amount of pressure we put on someone else. We put expectations of them to fill the voids we have, and more often than not, we don't even tell our partners what we need. We simply expect them to know and to give us this satisfaction in certain areas of our lives. So knowing all this, let's go back to the initial question. Why do most relationships fail? 
when reality strikes down the fairy tale illusions of falling in love, the romantic partner, rather than being a magical other, is revealed as who they really are a human. Humans are flooded creatures, so when we remove those rose tinted glasses, their faults, their flaws, and all their rough edges become obvious to us. And this is when reality hits you and it can happen overnight. But in most cases, this fantasy lens fades out slowly over time. Your partner, being the flooded person that they are, do not fully meet your expectations and do not always make you happy in the relationship. Your needs are not met. And this can cause very strong feelings of disappointment and many times resentment. And these feelings are a normal component of long-term relationships. For individuals enthralled to the myth of romantic love, the conclusion of the honeymoon period and the awareness of the widening gulf between their fantasy and who they want their partner to be and who they really are can be a troubling experience. So, as we remain captives of that myth of romantic love and chained to this search of the magical other, what we're doing essentially is that we are condemning our relationships from the start. Holding on to this expectation that your romantic partner should be the source of all your life's happiness and meet all your expectations leads to resentment and an incredible amount of pressure that can cause the relationship to collapse. And what also happens oftentimes is that a pathological dynamic develops and this dynamic can be very unhealthy as one partner always attempts to shape the other into their ideal image. And the other partner lives in fear that they are simply not going to be good enough ever for their partner. So they can take it to another level by spending all their time and efforts on catering for their significant other's needs. But again, that's not a healthy way to be in a relationship. Now that you know what causes the downfall of most relationships, what can you do to prevent your relationship from failing? Well, John Gottman, a psychologist and a specialist in relationships, talks about the six red flags to look for in any relationship. Using these six red flags, Gottman can tell with 91% accuracy if a marriage is about to fail. Gottman calls these six red flags signs of fruitless fire. So which are these? Number one thing to look out for is a harsh startup. This is where your partner or you start sentences with we need to talk or you did it again. That's a harsh start. Number two is to look for the four horsemen, which are defensiveness, contempt, criticism of your partner and stonewalling. Stonewalling basically means when your partner expresses a need and you are unresponsive. If your partner constantly shows these characteristics towards you, or if you do, be careful. Number three is flooding. This is where your partner has so many feelings that cannot even express them to you. And this usually hides emotions of anger. Number four is physiological distress. This is where the partnership is in such a bad shape that one partner starts to have physical issues. This could be related to stress. This could lead to heavy drinking. Something there is causing your body physically to shut down due to the stress that you're experiencing. Number five is bad memories. And this is where you or your partner only recall the negative side of things when you think about the memories that you share together. Lastly, number six is failed repair attempts. And this is basically where you cannot even end arguments with some resolutions or even find some common ground. With marriages and even any relationship, you're never going to see eye to eye on everything. You just are not, and that's okay. But what Godman has proven is how you speak to one another, resolve differences and see imperfections in one another are what will make or break your relationship. A successful relationship is seeing your partner as human. I'll leave you with one final quote from James Holland's book. He says, 
If I do not see and love my partner as a real person in the real world, if instead I elaborate a fantasy about him or her, using the person merely as a springboard for my imagination and my wishes, then I am doomed sooner or later to resent the actual person for not living up to my fantasies. Something small you can do that means a lot to me and will help me continue the effort of sharing psychology-based tools and resources is to like this video and subscribe to my channel. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next video.